ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಧಿಮರನ್ನಸಾಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮಿಧೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮ ಹೌ ಇಸ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಓಕೆ ಗುಡ್ ಓ ಹೋಪ್ಫುಲಿ ಬೈ ದ ಎಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಯು ಬಿ ಈವನ್ ಬೆಟರ್ ದನ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ನೌ I first offer my respectful obeisances to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who saved me from the darkness of the material world, deliberately, and who is the founder acharya of this great institution, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And we feel very fortunate to have a small space here in the middle of Silicon Valley. It's very valuable to have such space anywhere in the world, but especially here in Silicon Valley, it's a very strategic idea that we have to be in the middle of a very important place and to disseminate Krishna consciousness so that the already very um, talented people of this area can take advantage of their assets and connect them to the higher realm of Krishna consciousness and therefore I feel great happiness in life. So tonight we'll talk a little bit about taking conscious control of our lives because there is every chance that going through one's life, one can, instead of taking conscious control, drift. What is the meaning of drift? Anyone? What does it mean to drift? Slide away from the path. What else? Any other ideas? Without any purpose. Anything else? Drift. Yes? Well, we're talking about the word drift, yes? Deviation. And keep the microphones ready, too, because we may need them. Give us the full definition of drift. Drift as a verb means be carried slowly by a current of air or water. To be carried slowly, slowly. by a current of air or water. And then move passively, aimlessly, or involuntarily into okay. a certain... Of course, you could drift towards your destination, but there is more of a sense of being aimless, yes. not, pers- not deliberate, and therefore you can drift away. If you've ever had a practice that you've employed in your life and then you've found yourself not doing it, oftentimes it's not an immediate choice that you make that I'm going to stop doing this, but oftentimes it's more likely it's that I drift away one step at a time and I find myself in another place and away from my practice. Go ahead, Shraddha, what was more? Then it also means in terms of snow or leaves to be blown into heaps by the wind. Well, we don't want that to happen yeah. to us, right? <laughs> Digress or stray into another subject. Stray into another subject. A okay. continuous slow movement from one place to another, as a noun. The deviation of a vessel, aircraft or projectile from its intended or expected course as a result of currents or winds. So a how s- does that strike you? This uh, has too much gain or something? It's a little strange. The, the concept of drifting as opposed to conscious control of one's lifestyle. Can you relate to this concept of drifting? You're not on your intended course. Yes, I can give you an example. You can relate? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes while, while you're doing some work and suddenly there's a ping and you go into WhatsApp and that's it, you're so off your course. You know, after two hours later you realize that you didn't do what you were supposed to do. And can anybody relate to that? What she just said? Did you hear her back there? You're doing something deliberate and then you get a ping and you look at it and then two hours later you remember what you were originally doing. 
Possible? Yes? Okay, yes. Drifting. It's very applicable to me during chanting, the mind, it mm. drifts away. And even while reading sometimes, though I'm looking at the pages, my mind is drifting without me knowing. Right. So we can drift while we're doing a very, f what is supposed to be focused practice. And then we can find that the mind drifts away. And of course, unless we have an objective to start with, we won't know if we're drifting or not, will we? Because drift means to go away from the intended course. If you don't have an intended course, you won't know if you drifted or not. As was a line in Alice in Wonderland, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So you can just keep drifting or just aimlessly wander through the world. And this is what Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said of living entities in general. Brahmanda Brahmate Kon Bhagyavan Jeev Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lata Beach. He said, living entities are wandering. Brahmanda Brahmate. They're wandering throughout not just Silicon Valley, but throughout the universe. And this kind of wandering is aimless because one takes a new body every time one leaves the old body by the force of sangsara one's carried by the force of one's consciousness. And we don't know where we're going, and we don't know where we came from. So this is a kind of drift to be aware of. And then when we have an opportunity in the human form of life, Krishna says this is a very rare opportunity. Manushanam sahasreshu kashyad yatati sidhaye yatatam api sidhanam kashyim mam veti tattvataha. So there are many different species of life, but the human life is especially rare and it's also valuable because in the human form of life one can then make conscious decisions about one's lifestyle. And the best of all those choices, Krishna says, is to decide to fix the mind upon him. And this is the object, or Krishna is the object of meditation according to the Shastra. One has to put one's mind somewhere and Fixing the mind on Krishna means that one has come to a, a very high level of understanding the purpose of life. As Krishna says in the Gita, Yoma meva masamudo janati purushottamam sasarva vid bhajitimam sarva bhavin parata. Then one who knows me as the ultimate object of meditation and the purpose of life is the knower of everything, as Krishna is the source of everything. So what would you say would be the, we've talked about drift, what would you, how, how would you define a conscious control of lifestyle? Conscious control of your lifestyle as opposed to drift. How would you define it for yourself? Yes. Um, comparing all the time if I follow the instructions. Say again. Uh, I compare every time if I follow the instructions. Okay. If, I, if I'm doing that. that Which was, instructions? Uh, uh, that is said in uh, scriptures. Okay. That's so there's a way in which what conscious control of lifestyle means that we have decided upon a clear set of directives. And those typically we talk about coming from Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. These three sources. You mentioned Shastra. And so if one becomes acquainted with what is in the Shastra, as Krishna says in the Gita 331, ye me matam idam nityam anutishtanti manava, that understand my instructions and follow them. And he also says, ye shastra vidimutsri ja vartite kama karata, nasa siddhim avapnoti, nasukam na Param Gatim. What is Param Gatim? Param means the highest. And Gatim? Yeah, so he's saying in this verse, if you don't follow Shastra, ye, those who give up Shastra, ye Shastra Vidim Utsrija, they don't follow the rules of Shastra. Ye Shastra Vidim Utsrija, they give it up. Vartate Kamakarata, Nasa Siddhim. They don't get perfection. Avapnoti nak 
They don't get happiness and they also don't get the supreme destination, paramgatim. Krishna also mentions in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita that those who are against this way of life, in other words, they say, well, there is no God, there are no real directives, you just make them up as you go along. He says, Moga sha moga karmano moga jnana vichetasa raksha sima sirim chaiva mohit prakritim mohitim shritaha shritaha. He, those who take shelter of this kind of mentality, that, that, that there's no absolute uh, direction, he said, Moga sha, they become baffled. Moga sha moga karmano. In all their activities, ultimately they're baffled. Moga jnana, their knowledge becomes baffled. Rakshasima sirim chaiva prakritim muhitim stritha. And it's a, a demoniac mentality. So what you've suggested, having a clear idea of what's in the Shastra and then following that is exactly what Krishna just, uh, recommends in the Bhagavad Gita and is also recommended in the Srimad Bhagavatam and other uh, scriptures. These are, this is the way that we can be guided uh, properly. Other ideas for conscious control of lifestyle. Yes. I was also thinking that in order to know that you are drifting, you should know where you're going. So we should have goals defined and we should constantly monitor them. Yes. Very important to have an idea of your goal. When I was in Mayapur a few years ago, I took a boat out onto the Ganga and I was spreading some ashes of some departed soul and the boatman turned off the engine and we just sat there and it was hard to tell from the middle of the Ganga how fast we were moving but I could see way downstream there's a bridge and as I was sitting there I could see eventually how I was getting closer and closer to the bridge and without that point of reference I would have had no idea how fast I was moving downstream. And it, it's very important to have clear goals in our life also, to, to, to see, am I on track, am I drifting away, and how much progress am I making towards my goals. Therefore, throughout the Vaishnava Shastra, there are many signposts that tell us how we can understand the level of advancement that we're making in the process of devotional service. So one can measure by that. One can see for oneself how one's making progress. A couple more ideas about conscious control of lifestyle. So when it comes to the conscious control of mind, I think the four regulatory principles are very helpful. Um, and as as a teenager, I always wonder why four regulatory principles, you know, it's like you felt like you were getting tied down by mm -hmm. something. But then over the time as you grow and you you experience things and it's like, hey, wait a minute, that's for my own better good, better than drifting away from the place where you don't know where you're going to end up in. But at least here with this regulatory principles, you know what has been followed by the acharyas and the people you see in your real life and then people you see that taste what they have and then you compare with the outside world and then you it, it kind of helps you to see where you want to go which direction you want to drift so it's a conscious drifting that we choose on purpose to be who we want to be yeah very helpful comment both from practical realization, from being a teenager and wondering why should I follow the four regulative principles and then seeing for oneself. And also, the four regulative principles are counterintuitive counter to the world, world view these days that one should enjoy life to the utmost by engaging the senses in whatever way they take, take us. But there's an opposite idea Krishna gives in the Bhagavad Gita where he says that by learning to regulate and control the senses, one can attract the mercy of the Lord and actually enjoy real happiness. 
And this is a, a revelation to know that by restricting the senses or regulating them according to the scripture, Ragadvesha vimuktaistu vishayan indriyaishcharan by following these regulative principles of freedom, they actually free us. Eric Fromm distinguishes between freedom to do something and freedom from something. And the, the Bhagavad Gita talks about the way in which we, we can become free from the tyranny of our senses. Because there's this idea that the senses, when they're unregulated, and especially the mind, it becomes our enemy. And then it tyrannizes us. Have you ever had a plan and you were not able to follow the plan because your mind was uncontrolled and it took you in a different direction? And even though you were watching it unfold, you're watching it happen right in front of your eyes. You think, wait, but I have my own plan. And then your mind takes over and your senses take over and they take you in an opposite direction. Could even be a direction that you understand is detrimental to your goals in life. Has that ever happened to anybody? I see a few nods. Just say yes. yes. Thank you very much. So Krishna talks, Raga Dvesha Vimuktais Tu. There's a way in which this raga, this passion that drags me in, in various directions can be tamed. We can actually tame the senses and we can be freed from their impulses so that we're in a superior position. Krishna talks about this in the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita where he describes how lowest of all are the senses, and above the senses is the mind, above the mind is the intellect, and above the intellect is the soul. And of course we understand from the Gita also, above the, the spirit, the spiritual soul, which is different from matter, and different from the senses, and the, and the subtle mind and intelligence, there's also the super spirit, or the paramatma, who is giving us good intelligence and guidance. And Krishna talks about this throughout the Bhagavad Gita, doesn't he? He says that, I'm always there guiding you. He says, Ishvara sarvabhutanam hridesher junatishtiti brahmayan sarvabhutani yantra rudrani maya. He says, you're riding as on a machine made by the material energy, and I'm there within the heart directing you. And he directs according to our own desires. This is mentioned also in the Bhagavatam. Asau gunamayar bhavir bhuta sukshmendriyatma bhi at the beginning of a creation, the Lord gives us the kind of subtle body and mind that we desired, and he also enters within the bodies and subtle minds of every living being to help facilitate their desires. So he's there as a facilitator, an overseer, and a permitter, and he is the one who arranges for whatever we get. And therefore, he gives us instruction through which we can direct our desires towards liberation rather than becoming more entangled in the material world. So in the third chapter, he describes this. The lowest of all are the senses. Above the senses is the mind. Above the mind is the intellect. And above the intellect is the soul. Indriyani priyanyahur indribya param manaha manasas tu para budir yo bude paratas tu saha. And then he says at the end of that description that one should learn to control the lower self by the higher self. You should develop the higher self by practice, sadhana. Yo ma meva masamudo. Uh, no, excuse me. Evam budi param budva samstab yatmana mahatmana jahi shatram mahabaho kama rupam durasadam. He says, if you learn to develop your conscious lifestyle and your higher self becomes acutely aware, you become acutely aware of your existential situation within this yantra, within this physical body, 
you can learn to control the lower self by the higher self. And this is uh, one of the ways in which one lives a, a conscious lifestyle, not just drifting and not whimsically inventing various goals for oneself and then finding that once one reaches one, one's still left in a, left wanting. Did somebody else have another point about conscious control of lifestyle? I got reminded of something regarding to drifting. Yes. Uh, one of my uncles is into Navy, so we asked him, how do you get Navy? There? You yeah. have an uncle in the Navy? Yeah. <laughs> where, where is he stationed? He goes everywhere. I don't know where. All he over is. the world? Yeah. <laughs> Indian Navy? No. Yeah, Indian Navy. Indian yeah, Navy. Yeah. So uh, he was like, uh, we have to follow a compass. If we don't follow the compass, we will drift away from the direction. So I, it got reminded me of that. This is a nice example. Because when you're on the middle of the ocean, unless you have some point of reference, it just looks like the same direction anywhere you go. It's really hard to tell unless you know how to triangulate according to the stars or using a sextant or a compass. So you have to have some means of directing yourself. Anyway, you can go anywhere. So th this is really the point of Bhagavad Gita. Krishna is giving us a compass. We're in an ocean of material existence and any direction seems okay. When you come out of the womb, uh, you have, have no idea where you are anyway. And so anything anybody tells you sounds better than not knowing anything. It's just like, okay, schnicky, welcome. And then, guess what? Uh, you're from Cincinnati, Ohio, and so here's what your life is going to be like. And he's like, okay, I guess so. But when you get superior direction, you can follow it. And this is the exciting prospect of human life. You may begin your propitious journey towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead by inculcating the information in the Bhagavad Gita. Hansa Priya. It just made me realize that I have to put leash on Flickr, otherwise he'll just go oh, yeah. <laughs> anywhere and everywhere. And I was thinking similarly, do you know, we need uh, to put some sort of regulation on ourselves, otherwise our mind will be drifted in any direction. And it could be dangerous, he can get hit by a car too. So. Yeah, well, Krishna gives us an analogy in the Gita that the mind is unbridled. This is a horse example. If, if you don't bridle the horse, if you don't teach the horse how to uh, do some seva, then it'll just run free. And similarly, the mind that's unbridled will run free and can actually torture us in various ways because there's no um, limit to the depths that the mind can go to when left to its own devices. Yes. So for the conscious control of mind, um, the right kind of association, uh, devotee association, that also helps because you know we see people who are able to control themselves. So we move in the you know similar direction. And also, I was thinking like Seva, you said, so if we are in, engaged in some service, our mind is more focused. Very much so, thank you. Yes, Sangha and Seva are extremely important. And if, if one simply looks at one's Sangha, one's association, one can understand how one will be developing in the future because we're a product of our association. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, um, Purusha prakriti stohi bhunte prakriti jangunan karanam guna sangosya sarasad yoni janmasu. He definitively says that the cause of our good and bad results in life come from our previous association, previous and present association. In fact, even in the secular world, there are admonitions that you can understand what your net worth will be monetarily by looking around at the people you're associating with. <laughs> because you'll develop the same kind of habits and aspirations that they do. It's natural. And so th the modes of nature that we subject ourselves to will direct us in various ways. And conscious control of lifestyle has a lot to do with understanding this science that has uh, 
everything to do with association with Sangha. Sangha with the various modes of material nature will direct us uh, in different ways. If I associate with sattva gun, I will develop knowledge, I'll become virtuous, I'll be happy. If I associate with rajogun, I will develop unlimited longings and desires to enjoy the material world that never stop. And as I culture tamas, or ignorance, I'll feel a great depression, I'll feel helpless, that I can't do anything that I want to do, and I'll do incredibly stupid things that are self-destructive, that nobody can figure out, including myself, why I'm hurting myself. This is tamas. And this, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, has everything to do with my sangha. If you have sangha with people in tamas, you'll become a tamasic person. Prabhupada used to give the example of a drunkard. How does one learn to become a drunkard, he said. Well, you just find some people who are drunkards, and you can go hang out with them. He said you can, you'll go and sit with them, and then they'll teach you how to drink alcohol out of a brown bag, and then teach you how to stagger around, fall down on the ground, sleep on the cold pavement, wake up the next morning, and then uh, try to do it all over again. This is a, a, a lifestyle. It's not necessarily by choice, although one may make a bad choice in the beginning and take that kind of association, but that's what develops. And rajas similarly develops by associating with people who are actively engaged in pursuing unlimited longings and desires to enjoy the material world. And then sattva can be cultured by one's association and by one's habits. One can develop certain habits that are in sattva. For instance, the kind of food that one eats. If it's in sattva, then one will be infused with sattva gun by eating food that's sattvic. Also, if I work in an environment that's sattvic, then I'll also begin to develop those qualities. So yes, this association is very important. Yes, Sukeshwari. She was just thinking that how does the modes of material nature act on the mind? Is it um, like we read in uh, the scriptures that in the morning it's usually mode of goodness, in the afternoon it's mode of passion, and by the time it's evening it's mode of ignorance? Um, like in practical situations, how could we um, understand the effects of the modes on us? Well, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives very clear distinctions about what environments in the mode of goodness, passion, and ignorance look like, what foods are in the modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance, what kinds of attitudes are in the mode of goodness, passion, and ignorance. And the first time I read the Bhagavad Gita and understood the science to some degree, I was able to look around the world and distinguish for myself, oh, there's an environment that's in ignorance. And there's somebody who's in ignorance. I could understand more why people were acting the way they were. Because I could see through the eyes of the Bhagavad Gita that they were being influenced, as I was, by the various modes of nature. So you have to study it a little bit. You'll find uh, a lot of description in the third canto of the Bhagavatam, Lord Kapiladev, and also in the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, when Krishna is speaking to Uddhava, and in the Gita, there's a summary of what these modes look like when they touch us in various ways. So conscious control of lifestyle means learning the science of the three modes of material nature, understanding the power of these modes. They're called gunas. And Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, daivahi eshu gunamayi mama maya duratyaya. These gunas are not to be messed around with because they're very strong. And those who become aware of them are a little bit cautious around them. In fact, Prahlad Maharaj says in his prayers to Lord Nishingadev that I'm a little afraid of these modes of nature 
He sees them as a huge grinding wheel. And if you were to accidentally get your sleeve caught in that wheel when you're grinding something, it can then pull in your hand, arm, shoulder, then your head goes in, whole body. And he says, Nishpit Jaman Vibo Prapannam. He says, I'm seeing how there's this grinding going on in the material world. Even well-meaning people, when they're not careful, they don't know the science of, of association in the three modes of material nature, unwittingly get caught in the machine, and it's, it's not very discriminating. The machine doesn't stop for you and then let you go. You get ground up. So it's good to get an education in this, because you can learn everything else about how to manipulate the world for your own benefit. But unless you know the science of the three modes of material nature and how associating with the three modes of material nature will definitely affect you, then you won't get very far in any of the other categories of knowledge because you'll be constantly dragged under by the various modes of nature. The best way, Krishna says in the Gita, to stay above the grinding of the material modes of nature is to be engaged constantly in devotional service. Devotional service begins with shravanam kirtanam. That's hearing about Krishna and chanting about Krishna. Those are two things that one can naturally do as a human because humans are provided with two perfectly good ears normally and all you have to do is sit in front of transcendental vibration even if you're not accustomed to it at first and even if it's not the most interesting thing to you in the world, if you regulate yourself by sitting in the classes about Krishna, and we see this oftentimes, people who come who are not so much educated in the science of Krishna consciousness will, by some special impetus they have in their heart that they've received as a gift from devotees somewhere, they have a sentiment, maybe their parents were devotees. Maybe they had, they met some devotees somewhere, so they have a sentiment and they think, this is a good thing, even though I can't understand it. But by sitting and listening, gradually everything becomes known. You can know everything by hearing. You can understand the entire science. This is the magic of Shravanam. This is the direct process of devotional service, is hearing. If you direct your hearing process to hearing about Krishna, and very specifically hear the instructions Krishna gives in the Bhagavad Gita again and again, then your mind will become strong and you'll be able to discriminate between what is the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. Krishna mentions this in the Bhagavad Gita. He says that those who fall down into the lower modes of nature take irreligion to be religion and religion to be irreligion. <laughs> Those in the modes of goodness are able to distinguish that every living being is spiritual. They have this non-sectarian vision in the mode of goodness. They don't see one religion or another. They just see that each living entity is animated because they're part, the bodies are animated because they're part of Krishna. Vidya vinaya sampane brahmani gavihastani shuni chaiva shopakecha pandita samadarshina the learned person, which means learned in Bhagavad Gita, sees with equal vision a cow, a dog, an elephant, a dog eater, a brahmana, and a homeless person. And why? Because through sattvagum, sattvaguna, this modality, the higher modality of nature, uh, sattvam yad brahmadarshanam, from there you can see brahman, you can see spirit and the difference between matter and spirit. So the science is very important. One has to study it in order to stay above the grinding wheels of, of the modes of material nature and not get wound up. Even if one is a great scholar otherwise, if you don't know the science of Bhagavad Gita, you still haven't gained anything. And therefore Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, maya pritagyana. He says some people become very scholarly, intellectually, intellectually oriented. They may even study the Vedas but without any bhakti or without any reference to Krishna being the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then all of their knowledge is stolen away. So they don't actually get any traction in life and in a devotional service. So we have these two ways of approaching life. 
One is to focus on and invest in what's important. And one in a conscious control of lifestyle is very important to understand what's important. <laughs> you, have to you have to discern for yourself what is the most important thing in life. And you have to winnow out those things that are not important. And versus drifting on autopilot and uh, reacting to situations. So this conscious control, conscious control, it, it presupp presupposes a few things. I just made a few notes about what it means. If, 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 you, if you subscribe to this idea that there's a purpose in life, there's a higher goal in life, and that you're going to control your senses, your lower self by your higher self. It may mean uh, uh, all or several of the following, that there is a higher quality of life possible. You have to have some faith in, or understanding that there is a higher way of life possible other than just uh, letting life happen to you. Otherwise, why would you try? Because in any discipline to get from where you are now to a higher stage, you, you have to experience a little bit of, oh, what should, word should I use? What? Discomfort? Yeah, that could be there, discomfort. For instance, give me a discipline that you have to practice for that you may, may have to give up some things that you wanted to do in order to attain it. What? Cricket? If you want to have fit body, then we have to like... A fit body, yeah. A fit body, there's a very important exercise you have to learn. It goes like this. It's pushing the table away when, <laughs> when you're halfway through, not, not when you finished everything on it. A janitor told me that in the airport in <laughs> St. Louis. Actually, he told it to my friend who was a little bit... He said, you've got to learn this. He was a little pleasingly plump. You have to learn this exercise. Like, I said, what's that? It's the table. You've got to push it away from you. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to be fit, you have to learn this exercise. And you may, you may have to get up when it's cool outside and walk around the block even though you didn't feel like it. You want, your mind, your lower self was saying, let's stay in and what? Sleep or... Watch TV, oh my God. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that your lower self might say, uh, I think this is a better idea. But in order to come to a higher level, you have to have some impetus. And that impetus means you understand that there's a higher life for you if you put in the, the work. So this, this idea of conquering the lower self by the higher self and conscious control of lifestyle means somewhere either you believe or you understand through realization that there's, there's a higher level of existence available to you. Otherwise, you won't even try. You won't even know the difference. That's what, what Krishna calls in the Bhagavad Gita mudha. Uh, mudha means a, a donkey, an ass. Uh, donkeys are actually kind of friendly creatures, but... Uh, people take advantage of them because they're hard workers and they just say, work, and the donkey goes, okay. And uh, it's like all they expect is a little grass and they don't question about higher existence or a different kind of work. They just go on working hard. So Krishna describes this kind of existence, uh, unquestioning, just working at whatever base level one's working at without looking for a higher path. So you, this is the first thing that, this conscious control of lifestyle presupposes that there is a higher quality of life possible. It's possible for me also. Say that, it's possible for me. It's possible for me. Yeah, this could be on, on cable. Okay, uh, that the self is an agent of, of change. Repeat that one. The self is an agent of change. You say, I am an agent of change. Yes, this is... Another a presupposition that to reach a higher goal in life, uh, conscious control of lifestyle, that I have the wherewithal to change. I can actually better myself. It's important to keep in mind. 
I'm not at the mercy of my lower self. I am higher than the senses. I'm higher than the mind. I'm higher than the intellect. And if I follow an authorized system, I can reach the higher levels of conscious living. And I'm the one who chooses. I have to make that decision myself because I am an agent of change. Now, sometimes people claim that they're victims of circumstances. They're victims of their mind. They're victims of their senses. This may very well be true for the time being. But the Shastra says, even though that's true for the time being, you can change. You are an agent for change because you're actually higher than those other elements that seem to be dragging you down, those other influences. You can overcome them. Otherwise, Srila Vyasadeva says in the Vedanta Sutra, there wouldn't be admonitions in the scriptures inviting you or ordering you to rise, to wake up. The Shastra says, don't stay in darkness. Come to the light. And throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, you'll, you'll find Krishna urging, in the Gita, urging Arjuna to stand up and fight. And he's not just talking about the Kurukshetra battle. He's talking about stand up and come to the higher level of conscious control of your life. And if he's saying it, what Srila Vyasadeva says, that means it's possible. And then he goes on to say, the scriptures are speaking to all of us, not just Arjuna. Therefore, it's possible for you and you and you and me. Everybody can do it. So you have to understand, I'm an agent for change. I can actually rise above the lower self. Then you also have to have a clear distinction and understand that there is a lower self and a higher self. This is something we've already mentioned, but this is on the list, that knowing there's a lower self and a higher self is very important because as we're moving about the world doing our Krishna conscious, our conscious duty, we may be invited by the lower self to deviate. Possible? Yes. yes. And if you're very distinguishing, if you've developed your awareness of the difference between the lower self and the higher self, then when that invitation comes, you can realize that that's not a place you want to go. If somebody invites you to uh, a celebration at their house, and then you remember that they're all uh, drug dealers and there's guns lying around the house and there's <laughs> warrants for p their arrest at their house, you might think, oh, maybe I don't want to go there for that birthday party. Maybe I'll skip it this time. So similarly, when the lower self comes calling and says, why don't you try this or why don't you do that? One may be able to then recall, oh, I don't want to hang out in that neighborhood. That's not my neighborhood. I don't belong there. Lower self, higher self, very important to keep that in mind. Then, uh, presupposes that higher knowledge, advice, and direction is available. So we, we have to understand that Krishna has made knowledge available to us, choice knowledge, selected knowledge, just for us. For instance, in the Bhagavatam, anarto pasanam sakshad bhakti yoga madhoksaje, the very reason that Srila Vyasadeva agonized over his editing of the Vedas, he divided it into various sections, and then he came out with the Mahabharata. And he, he very specifically did this because he understood in the age of Kali Yuga, people would not have the capability of understanding the Vedas. And then he uh, brought forth the Puranas and compiled those. He was, he's a, the literary incarnation of God. And then he was still not feeling complete. He met his spiritual master for a conference and said, you know, what do I do now? And his guru told him that you have to be even more specific about how to reach the ultimate goal of life and tell what the ultimate goal of life is. He said, Naish karmyam apyachuta bhava varjitam, nashobade gyanam alam niranjanam, kutak puna shashvada bhadram ishvare, nacharpitam karma yadapyakaranam. He said, even if you come up with a whole line of self realization, 
but it's not specifically aimed at a chutta bhava, that is, developing emotional feelings for the personality of God. Then he said, it doesn't look very good. And the people are not going to be able to sustain it. It won't satisfy them ultimately. So this is a very deliberate uh, campaign that Krishna has made for us. This is something to understand and appreciate every day. The Bhagavad Gita is not just some a random scripture that's floating around the world that it's meant to sit on people's shelf with a little plastic cover on it. Nobody ever touches it, but they just say, see, Gita, I know what the Gita is. Uh, I've heard of it before. I've read two verses. It means do your work. Uh, <laughs> that's not the Gita. The Gita is Krishna specifically, deliberately reaching out to everyone in Silicon Valley and speaking to them in their ears. Let those who have ears hear. And his instructions are so perfectly honed and directed towards us that if anyone simply hears them, they, they can awaken. They can develop a conscious control over lifestyle just by hearing that vibration coming from Krishna. So it's important to understand that the higher knowledge and advice and direction is not only a available, but it is specifically designed for us. This is, when you hold the Bhagavad Gita, you should think, this is for me. Krishna is speaking to me. He spoke this for me. Let me take advantage of it. And then finally, conscious control of lifestyle, the, the, the kind of trouble that you'll go to in order to attain a higher type of lifestyle, that is a conscious control of lifestyle, is that um, one f if one follows higher direction, one may improve oneself. And we talked about this, about how there is higher direction available, and simply by following it, we can elevate ourselves. It's very similar to the previous point, but it's a general category. Understanding that not all directions are the same. Some are superior to others. And the directions given very specifically by Krishna and his devotees that are related to self-realization and to developing love of God are the best of all. And those are included in the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam. So if one understands that, that these are the best literatures of all, then one will be very careful to take in that knowledge on a regular basis. This is part of developing a conscious control over lifestyle. So, I'll just make one other point, and then we'll take a few reflections. Uh, we've, in any kind of learning or development program, one has to have a strong motive. The word motivation comes from motive. If you're motivated, you have to have a motive. For instance, in a in a court trial when they're trying to decide whether a person is guilty or innocent, one of the places they look is his motive. Did he have a motive? He didn't have a motive. Probably not a candidate. Motive is extremely important. And if we can notice or develop our own motive towards developing a conscious control of lifestyle, this will enable us to overcome the obstacles that come on our path, if our motive is strong enough. That motive includes a faith that I'll be better off if I stick to this. <laughs> and the example I've seen in motive is people learning languages. If somebody is learning a language but they don't really have to, it may take them 20, 30, 40, 50 years, or they may never learn it if they don't have to learn it. But if somebody has to learn a language, like a little baby, a baby has to learn a language in order to get what he or she wants, be able to express clearly, to be part of the social situation that he or she is in, they have a very strong motive to learn how to talk. They listen, they repeat, and they 
continue trying. And there are other people too, grown-ups also can learn languages. But mostly they learn it when they're in a situation where they really have to. I've, I, I know devotees who go to other countries and their livelihood depends on learning the local language. They learn it very quickly. Whereas somebody else who doesn't have a strong motive, uh, what's the difference? Maybe they have a weak motive and they may think, oh, I'll look good if I know a second language. But that's not strong enough. You have to have a feeling that unless I get this, I won't survive. It has to become that strong. So in order to be successful in developing conscious control of lifestyle, one has to be strongly motivated. There are several ways that one can do this. In the Gita, Krishna says that you should become acutely aware of the nature of the material world. What is the nature of the material world? It's a happy place. Uh, we get to keep whatever we uh, acquire from our hard labor. And noth nothing or nobody that we love ever uh, disappears from our sight. And we're always comfortable. Does that sound about right? <laughs> no? No? What about all the stories? I, they lived happily ever after. <laughs> well, let's compare. What does Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita? What are some of the characteristics he ascribes to the, to the material world? What is it? Anityam asukam lokam imam prapya pajasvama. So anityam, it's temporary. And what else? Asukam, it's not a happy place. This is not your happy place, souls. Souls, you're not in your happy place right now in the material world. Uh, what else does he say about the material world? What? Dukalayam. Now that sounds ominous. There's, uh, alayam is a place. There are places you go if you want to go bowling. You go to the bowling alley. That's the bowl alayam. You could, if you start a bowling alley, you could call it <laughs> bowl alayam. <laughs> if you want to get some rotis, you go to the bojan alayam. And if you want to, if you want a good whooping, if you want some misery, you come to the dukalaya. That's the material world. So the material world is not a happy place, and Krishna says, remember that it's fraught with birth, death, old age, and disease. Keep that in mind. And if you go through the Bhagavatam, we just did an experiment in, in, during the Kartik. We listened to Bhagavatam for five hours a day. We went through the third and fourth cantos, everything, all the verses and all the purports, and we just sat there and listened. And we were astounded when we came to the end. We made a wrong turn somehow coming to the material world. Uh, one of the brahmacharis that was there, after he heard a whole section on the material world and renunciation, he came to uh, Keshav Bharti Maharaj, his guru, and he said, what was I thinking? <laughs> What was I thinking? Uh, unless one gets this information and under understands uh, that I'm, I'm in a dangerous situation. Anityam. It's, it's very temporary. And I, I, I have options. to I can opt out of this. So one may, from this kind of study, develop a strong motive. You have to be strong motive to come out of this situation in the material world. So motive is very important. So now I'll take a few uh, reflections. And before we give a reflection, everybody please move up by 7.2 inches. Mukarvind is ready to go. <laughs> uh, Maharaj, um, strong motivation. Wait I one sec till everyone gets settled. It's hard to listen when you're relocating. Okay. 
a strong motivation i remembered one of the parents telling me that when um, they have some mother tongue and generally the children learn here the english or other language so when so how to make them to learn the mother tongue whatever so they told that <laughs> whenever they need to have to they need something they will make sure that they tell in the mother tongue and unless they don't tell they don't give so <laughs> there is strong motivation that comes i was just yes uh, exactly yeah also i have an insight on the higher self and lower self how mm. it works so prabhupad once told a, an example and he said that there are thieves who stole the money and then when he got into a place then they said today now we will divide it morally so, so all the things so their higher self is also working for a lower self cause so prabhupad mentioned that it all depends on your consciousness and where you're reposing your thought process yeah don't be complicit with the lower self that's working for illegal means by illegal means to attain goods and then you'll be you'll be also accused skeshri really love the points prabhu i was just thinking that um, we are a conscious self and we are way about the senses the intelligence and you know the mind basically which troubles yes. all the time so i was um, the i got that point the question i had was what is the real lower self we are talking about and what is the higher self is a lower self because we have accumulated in our mind uh, for a time immemorial all the last anger greed that is reflecting in a wrong way and then we should stop um, like i've even heard from guru maharaj lectures where he says bad dog and the good dog so is that the bad dog the the false self and the good dog is our true self yes I mean, yeah. yeah so there's uh, our false sense of self means i am this body and everything in relation with this body is mine and the real self the real ego so that means self identification we do have a self it's not that we don't have a self it's just we're it we're wrongly oriented when we think we're the body because we're not but the real ego is i am a servant of krishna eternally and when we become situated in, in that identity by hearing sambandha gyan from the right source then bhakti vinod thakur says jeev krishna das a bishwas korle to adhukonai bengalis is that understandable what did it mean jeev krishna dosh a bishwas korle or to go nai so if if the if the self knows that he is a servant of krishna then there is no misery no misery him. yes so this is the lower lower self and the higher self lower self is contaminated by material nature also krishna it gives a catalog so we can understand he says bhumir apo analo vayu kamano bhudirevacha ankara ityame bhinna prakritirashtara earth water fire air ether mind intelligence and false ego these are the the separated material elements he says there's a different element there's a different entity that's mixed up with those aparayamitostanyam prakritim vidhimi param jiva bhuta mahabaho yayedam taritejagat besides these elements he just listed he said there's a higher element that is the self categorically different from matter and being situated in that understanding that i am the self and i'm part and parcel of krishna is perfect knowledge i j- i was just wondering that so that far is that i'm part and parcel of krishna and i'm his servant that is perfect knowledge yes so i was just wondering that it's the thoughts that um, make uh, me a better person i mean my uh, earlier thoughts have always been the exposure of Uh, exposure to all the bad things like so called the material things now that my mind is exposed to the scriptures um to the association of devotees to the to the service automatically it's getting purified so um so feeding the uh, low self or the bad dog is when such thoughts come you just have to let it go and when good thoughts come you have to reinforce is is that the way we deal with it yes the three ways prop and mentions in the fifth canto bhagavatam He said first one is by neglect. So if you don't feed the dog, then he'll gradually go away. And that's the same with guests. If you get guests at your house that you don't like, 
first feed them, but don't put any salt. And they say, can I have a little salt? And say, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have any salt. And then the next day you can take out some other spice. And then they'll just like, I thought you were going to stay here till Thursday. No, we got to go. <laughs> so similarly <laughs> with these urges, if one neglects them, doesn't feed them, then they gradually go away. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur says, you have to beat the mind with shoes in the morning and the evening. It means when you wake up in the morning, you have to have some system that the sound vibration, transcendental sound vibration starts right away. And devotees who are sadhakas, they're practicing devotional service, they wake up at a, at a regulated time. They set the alarm deliberately the night before, and maybe they have two alarm clocks. They put one alarm clock across the room. You know if you put the alarm clock next to your head, there's every possibility that you'll sleep for another half an hour. <laughs> but if you put it across the room, it's a conscious choice at night. That you go, you know what you're doing, right? You're you're completely eliminating the possibility that you're going to sleep past this time. And then you have to say, yeah, that's what I want to do. I'm getting up at that time. And then when you get up, you have to have a way to begin engaging in the process of, of Shravanam Kirtanam, immediately hearing and chanting. So one thing that you can do electronically is immediately put on a lecture or a kirtan as you start hearing right away. This is beating the mind with shoes. And at night, too, before you go to bed, the mind after work, after uh, whatever you've done, it may just tail off and go in any direction. So you have to have some plan. That's why in ashrams, de devotees have a, a regulated system. So they, they have a program through everything. And after a while, you start to develop a taste for it. Mangalartika is sweet. Sometimes the mind will become... Let's, oh, uh, why these people are dancing. I don't feel like dancing. Uh, you know, they don't know the problems I have. They can dance, but I got problems. <laughs> but what I've found in attending these authorized, scheduled programs throughout ISKCON, the best policy is to merge into the program. Become one with it. Don't let your mind separate you and say, like, oh, these guys, you know, they're too enthusiastic or whatever. Be one with it. Embrace the whole thing and don't say, now they're going to do these prayers. I've heard them a million times. I'm going to go do something else. I think I'm going to go polish the bumper of my car while they're finishing the 10 offenses. Merge. Merge. You never heard, thought you'd heard that here. <laughs> Merge into the, into the program. Go into the ten offenses. Think about them. Go with the program. And if you do that, you'll find that actually it's an authorized process. If you simply follow it, there's Mangalartik, there's Tulsi Puja, there's, you know, in ISKCON they have a system. They go through, like, just go into it. And you'll find that the mind will become happy and go, I can do this. I can be happy. Also, never miss a chance to dance. Never miss a chance to dance. If there's a chance to dance, dance. It's one of the simplest ways to actually overcome the mind. Even if you ask Tony Robbins, he'll tell you the same thing. But he doesn't know why. But actually, <laughs> you know, there's this whole science that if you engage the body, you know, you're depressed, so look up, you know, and then suddenly your countenance changes, your, your feelings change. Lord Chaitanya already built this into the whole system. You put your hands in the air and start, you know, going back and forth. It, and all the cares that you had before is like, ah, forget it. I'll just be happy. I'll just merge right now into the holy name. I'll be happy. So this, everything's there in Krishna consciousness to rise above the three modes of material nature. You just have to do it. And it's kevala anandakanda. It's a happy path. It's a, it's a program of great joy. And you can just be part of it and follow it. Even if you don't want to invent all kinds of new things to do, uh, Prabhupada said, I've given the chanting of Hare Krishna such a simple but profound process, but now I see my disciples, they're collecting stacks of austere books. 
I have to read this, that, this, that, all these different things. Of course, it's important to read. And we have Bhagavatam, Chaitanya, he's not talking about that. But there's a way the mind wants to invent all kinds of new things for a shortcut or an inside track. Just follow the simple process very joyfully and merge into it and you'll find that you're flying above the modes of material nature. And you'll never look back if you simply become a humble person and say, okay, I'll take the process. What other things? Yes. One, two. Or one, two. Hare Krishna. Um, Haraj, when you mentioned that uh, all the scriptures, they are for everybody. Uh, sometimes it's so hard when uh, reading and just so hard to associate with myself. Uh, or Krishna was speaking to Arjuna or somebody, the saint is telling to this person and not relating and sometimes reading like a, uh, like a stories <laughs> and not associating, but knowing and thinking this is for myself and Krishna is speaking to myself like this. Is. Yes, and this is one of the ways that one can develop a, a relationship with Krishna directly is through the scriptures. If you submissively hear that means you hear without envy. And you simply accept that there's somebody higher than me. There's knowledge that's beyond my purview that I can't understand with my intellect. I can't grab it and reprocess it and say, now I figured it all out. But you just sit there and listen and you accept that there's a higher authority. If you listen in that mood and say, I'm insignificant, there is higher knowledge that's coming down to me and you let it come in. You don't block it at every step then it will transform your heart. This is the process of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Shrinvatam swa kata Krishna. This, just by hearing Krishna, punya shravana kirtana, you start acquiring these assets, spiritual assets, that give you the power to control the lower self by the higher self. You'd be surprised. You sit there and listen, and all you really have to do is make sure you're in the room and try to shut off the envy button. And if you just do that and just try to contain yourself and listen carefully, then the vibration itself will transform you. And you'll walk out of the room and then you'll think, oh, I'm a different person. I have more power than I did before to control the lower self by the higher self. I can live a conscious lifestyle. I can choose Krishna consciousness by my own will because now I know the difference between matter and spirit. I just heard about it and it went in and Krishna is also reinforcing it. He's there within the heart and he helps those who listen carefully. He's actually assisting us in the process if we listen carefully. Yes. Hare Krishna um, Maharaj. I mean, I really like the point Dukhalyam. And it reminded me yesterday of an incident during book distribution at Fisherman's Wharf. Uh, there was a girl who came, Lin Yu, and then um, she saw the books and then she shared that uh, she tried all sorts of intoxication and everything. She's like, and she found everywhere unhappiness. And then she said, like, I'm, I've given up. And then she was very happy to get the books. And she's like, uh, she's understanding, like, there is a higher uh, self and... Uh, how she can, and she was very much into it. She wants to know more about it. She took, she also chanted the mantra and then uh, said that she wants to practice humility. This Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Bahunam Janmanam Ante Gyanavan Mam Prapadyate Vasudeva Sarvamiti Sa Mahatma Sudurlava. After many births and deaths, one comes to knowledge and then understands that Vasudeva is everything and then he, he surrenders. And there is a collective memory that we get from going through many, many lifetimes. There are various kinds of memory. And there's a memory in which we feel ourselves more and more alienated from the material world, that this is not my place. That I have a, a recollection that by engaging in the material world, I actually get burned. This uh, accumulates in the heart. And there are many souls wandering the universe in this state, and when, in what we call a ready state. And then when you show them the Bhagavad Gita, they look at it and it fits. And it answers the question that they've been asking, why am I suffering? Who am I? What is the ultimate goal of life? And Prabhupada points this out, the distribution of Bhagavad Gita is the greatest philanthropical work in the world. You can't, he says this in the fifth canto, 
You can't help anyone's material body. It's impossible. They already have their own set karma. For instance, you can give medicine to somebody, but it doesn't mean they're going to recover. You can put them in an oxygen tent. doesn't mean that they're going to get their breathing back. You can try everything that you want. The material body is going to go through the phases that it goes through anyway. So the kind of work that one does to help other people's bodies, uh, we can't even help our own body. Ultimately, that's not real help. What the real help is, is what you're doing. Giving the Bhagavad Gita to people here, there, and everywhere. Because once they read it, then they can actually take a conscious control of their lifestyle, conquer the lower self by the higher self, and they can leave the, the process of karma. It's not an eternal process. It's something that can come to an end if one gets Krishna Bhakti. Yes, Twindragopa Matavendra Mahosa Karma, Bandan Rupa Palabhajana Matanoti, Karmani Nirdhati Kintu Chapakti Bhajam, Govindam Ari Purusham Tamaham Bhajami, Aprarabdha Palam Papam Kutam Bijam Palon Mukam, Karmai Naiva Praliyante Vishnu Bhakti Ratatmanam. Both these verses say, that although everyone in the universe, from Indra down to the tiny Indra Gopa germ, little bug, are all being affected by their previous karmas, if one worships Govinda, then one's karma is being diminished. And the second verse I quote is saying, everybody's implicated in karma. It starts aprarabdha. There's karma coming up in your life that you can't see yet, but it's, it's there. It's real. It's just like if you got filmed at the intersection when one of those cameras going through on a red light. You may go home, have dinner, and think everything's fine, but a couple days later, you're going to get a letter in the mail that says, guess what? You owe us, what is it? 375? <laughs> Malini, how much is it? <laughs> 375. That's a lot. I mean, and you didn't know it was coming. That's aparabdha, palam. There's also the fruit of karma you're getting right now. Papam. All these kinds of sinful activities are there, but the Shastra says uh, they're going to unfold in your life no matter what, unless Vishnu Bhakti Ratatmanam. You're engaged in Vishnu Bhakti. Circumambulate Tulsi Devi. Uh, Hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. You're erasing your karma. It's all going away. Say Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Eradication of all karmas. These are the ways in which one becomes freed from this cycle of karma in the material world by practicing bhakti. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. I have uh, two questions on behalf of one of my friends. So one first question is, uh, so if we have, uh, from a career point of view, if we have goals, how do we align them with spiritual values? That's one question. Second. Okay, let me answer one of the questions. One point is that Krishna gives in the Bhagavad Gita that when you work in the world, you're going to get some kind of reward for it. And if you offer uh, a portion of that to Krishna, then uh, it will purify the whole activity and it'll, it'll make you think of Krishna while you're doing it. And if you can't do that, if you can't give it to Krishna for some reason, like you might be in a family that's monitoring your finances and they won't let you give it to Krishna consciousness, then he says, give it somewhere. Give it to some worthy cause. Because when you give it away in charity, you'll start realizing that actually it wasn't mine in the first place and you, your soul will start growing. You'll start understanding that I'm not a material body. You'll see the difference between the body and the self by being detached from the fruits of your work. This is recommended in Bhagavad Gita in several places. So that's one of the ways in which uh, one can do that. And also Prabhupada quotes in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the Acharyas say, whatever work you're doing in the world, you should think, this is my prescribed work given to me by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Let me offer my labor to him. You should consider like that. Because everyone has to do some kind of work. And we all are situated in various places. So think of Krishna as you work and think, I'm doing this for Krishna. And Krishna, of course, says in the Gita, yat koroshi yat ashnashi yat johosi dadasi yat, yat tapasyasi konti yat, tat kurushva manarpadam. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer, give away, whatever austerities you perform, do it as an offering for me. 
And if you consider that and you do that, then you'll be properly situated in your work. And finally, in the eighth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu mamanu smarayudyacha mayarpita mano budir mami vaishyasya samshayaha. And that is, uh, he tells Arjuna, because you have to work anyway, if you work and think of me at the same time, then your work and your life will become purified. And Prabhupada gives the advice in the purport that if you chant Hare Krishna, if you, you're, you have a regulated practice of chanting Hare Krishna and you're working at the same time, or you work and you're always chanting Hare Krishna at the same time, then you'll, you'll purify your existence and your work will become purified. What's the second one? Thank you, Bharat. Second question is, um, in the beginning of spiritual quest, uh, we tend to be over-enthusiastic and this vairagya, yukta vairagya. So instead of yukta vairagya, we get vairagya. and We try to move away from responsibilities. How do we ensure we don't do that mistake? By having good guidance. If you have guidance, Gaudiya Vaishnavism is a, cultural, a culture of guidance. We take guidance at every step. And when you have good guidance, you can ask along the way, should I do this or that? Which, when you're trying to make decisions, life decisions, ask those who have experience already. I have uh, various devotees that I trust, and when I'm trying to make a hard decision, I call them up. Right, Nirkula? Don't I call people all the time? Yep, I call people all the time and say, okay, this is what's happening, these are the choices, what should I do? And I ask them. And once I ask them, then I, then I start to develop a clear idea of what I should do, composite. Sometimes I ask seven people, you know, elevated people, and then you, you look at the answers, and it starts to come together as a composite. And then you say, okay, that's what I should do. Find your, find your mentors in your life, those that are aligned with your ultimate purpose, and uh, go and serve them, and then make inquiries. Tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya uparakshanti te jnanam jnaninas tattvadarshina. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, approach a tattvavit, somebody who's seen the truth, and then be very humble, submit yourself to that person, offer service, and make relevant inquiries, and you shall be enlightened. So if, if you do that throughout your life, you find those who can enlighten you because they've seen the truth. Verify that that's how they live and what their goals are. Then you'll be properly directed throughout your life. And you got to ask a lot because there's a lot of things. And don't be ashamed to ask. Even Srila Vyasadev had to ask. And he's God, so... <laughs> yes, one more. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thanks for the wonderful lecture. Just have a question about the motivation. <clears throat> so in any of our, or in our every endeavor, I mean, since we are not a pure soul, there's some kind of a tinge of uh, our some imprints which are sitting in our heart, even towards uh, doing any devotion service or in our uh, personal endeavors towards career and all. So in spite of knowing that, it sometimes, I mean, we feel, I mean, like it's not a pure, I mean, even though we want to, do service in Krishna consciousness or wants to be much more pure towards our devotion service. Still, I mean, we have that probably is kind of a sense gratification or towards any material gains. So how to, I mean, uh, be, we make a peace with that. Okay, that's, it's a part of the process and uh, we are moving on to that. So we'll find many examples in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada said before he left this world, one of the last things he told us was, read Srimad Bhagavatam together and discuss and all your questions will be answered. So one of the great examples of this that will answer your question quite nicely is Kardamamuni. Kardamamuni meditated for 10,000 years. He was a pure sage, pure devotee. Otherwise, why did the Lord appear before him directly on Garuda? And why did he shed a tear for his devotee out of compassion, feeling so much love for Kardama Muni? Kardama Muni meets Lord Narayan on Garuda in this beautiful, lonely place in the, in the jungle. And then in his prayers, he says, My Lord, I need a wife. 
And Lord Narayan says, I know. <laughs> and Prabhupada explains that everybody requires a certain level of sense gratification. You can't artificially just say, I'm going to become a Paramahamsa. Because that's a, a position that requires uh, great mercy from all different directions, from one's dedication to one's guru throughout the entire lifetime and struggle through all the different s situations in your life, making the right choices at, at every point or not making the right choices and then changing them later. It's not something that comes cheaply. And Prabhupada acknowledges that, that Karta Mumuni was a pure devotee, but he, he had some desire, and he asked the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Prabhupada then mentions that Lord Narayan had arranged for him to get a wife. And which wife did he get? Devahuti. Who's Devahuti? Yeah, she's the, the daughter of a, a, a king and also one of the great Manus of the universe. I mean, you, can't, you don't get any better pedigree than that. So he says, if you have a material desire, it's better you worship the Lord and ask him and let him make the arrangement. Because if you make it on your own, you may not get Devahuti. You may get... <laughs> <laughs> but but Karda Mamuni attained perfection in life. At every stage of life, we may require something. And Bhagavatam says, Akama sarva kama va moksha kama udharadi tivrena bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param. Said whether you have no desires, whether you have all material desires, whether you want liberation, or the, whether you're a pure devotee, you should always approach Krishna because he's the source of all these things. And tivrena bhakti yogena, when you approach Krishna, there's got to be some bhakti. And that bhakti will allow you to. At the same time, you, you're awarded your desire that you're asking for in the way that Krishna wants to give it to you. You'll also eventually attain bhakti, and therefore the story of Dhruva Maharaj is there. He didn't want bhakti. Dhruva Maharaj wanted a kingdom that was better than his grandfather. He wanted to show them. He was ticked off. He, he was insulted, and he walked out of that palace like, I'm going to show you. My mother used to say this to me. She said, never under, underestimate the power of all show them. <laughs> and, and so he, he, was, he was on a tear. He just heard, you can find God in the forest. You go out there and ask him, and he'll take care of you. He'll give you that kingdom that you want. That's what he wanted. And he met Narada Muni, who said, ah, oh, you know, it's okay. You go home. And he said, thanks, but I got to go. And then Narada empowered him, and he taught him, okay, if you want to attain it, attain it through bhakti. He gave him a mantra. He showed how to worship the deity. He told him how to meditate on the Lord. And that's what he did. And at the end of it, the material desire was gone. And all that was left was, my Lord, I'm a fool. I shouldn't ask for anything in the first place. I just want you. So bhakti's perfect. And we may not be, but as we approach Krishna, satyam dishiti artitam artiton rinam, naivartito yad, Punam artito yata, swayam vidate bhajatam manichatam ichapitaram nijapadapalavam. The Bhagavatam says that when somebody approaches Krishna and they keep asking him for stuff over and over again, give me this, give me that, he gives it, but he gives it in such a way you won't ask for it anymore. <laughs> and then he covers your material desire with his uh, with bhakti, and then all what you're left with is service to his lotus feet. So it's always best to approach Krishna no matter what state of consciousness or what you want. And Krishna even says in the Bhagavad Gita, all these people are dear to me. Chaturavida bhajante mam jana sukritino arjuna arto jignasa artarti jnani cha bharatarshaba. He names four kinds of people that approach me. And three of them, are, one's just inquisitive. The other one uh, wants some material benefit, wants money. The other one wants to get free from suffering. And the other one's a pure devotee. But Krishna says all of them are great souls. Udarak sarva evaite jnani tvatva evam astita sahyukta ma ma evam utamam gatim. He said they're all magnanimous souls. Udara sarva evaite. Why? Because they're approaching me. If you go somewhere else, that's, 
that's a mistake. But if you go to Krishna, even though you know you have material desires, that's okay. It'll come out okay. So, a couple more points. That is, to continue this discipline for a conscious lifestyle, one should also take guidance from experts. This is the quick way to advance in the process of devotional service. Find out who the experts are and follow them. Bejare muniyo tagre bhagavan tambadhok sajam satvam vishudam shemaya kalpante ye nutani ha. If you follow the previous acharyas who knew what they were doing when they worshipped Krishna, you just follow their path, follow in their footsteps. Uh, even if you can't do it at the same level they're doing, because you're trying to follow in their footsteps, you will attain, this, you will get the same result they got. Because you're starting from your level, they're starting from their level, but because you're trying to follow them, you'll attain the same kind of perfection that, that they achieved through their process. Hey, Vrindavan. Um, some of the benefits of making this decision to do discipline one's life to attain Krishna consciousness we call living a conscious lifestyle or that you develop spiritual integrity. Integrity is a very powerful force. It's a quality, but it gives one great power in life. That means the more one's able to follow the process the best one can from whatever situation one's in now, one by increments will start to develop integrity. By this I mean one will recognize within one's own self one's sincerity to attain perfection in Krishna consciousness. And even though I may not be able to do it right now, if I can at least recognize my sincerity, and in whatever opportunity I have, I try to take the best advantage of it according to my capability, then I start to develop an awareness of the fact that I'm acting on my sincerity. And from this, I begin to develop integrity. I recognize my own sincerity and I recognize that I'm trying to do the right thing. There's nothing more inspiring than this. What's debilitating in this world is living a false life. And that is following the lower self even though I should be following the higher self. A child, the mother says, you should brush your teeth. A child says, yes, I'll, I'll brush my teeth, mother. And instead of brushing his teeth, he goes in, takes a toothbrush, puts a little toothpaste on it, messes it around with his thumb, puts it under the water, and puts it back. <laughs> Did you brush your teeth? Yeah, mother, I brushed my teeth. At 30 years old, he's wearing dentures. Because <laughs> his teeth fell out. There's a way in which the contamination of material nature impels me to cheat. Try to get something for nothing. This is the influence of the lower self. And if one can hear Bhagavad Gita sincerely, one can associate with those who are trying to break free, free from this cheating propensity and are sometimes successful at it. One will also be caught up in this idea and this kind of lifestyle. And as one has one little victory after another and experiences I, I was just victorious. My mind told me to do something that was against my plan and against the scriptures, and I, I fought with it. I, my mind took shelter of the Bhagavad Gita, and I got some inspiration from seeing those others I was associating with, and I didn't do it. And in that one instant, I look at myself and I say, you were just victorious. 
You're a hero. You have integrity. And that becomes one's most important asset. And the more that one becomes one's most important asset in life, the more one becomes dedicated to a conscious lifestyle. Not a lifestyle of cheating, of showing that I'm something. Because this is the false ego. Always wants to show something, even in the realm of devotional service. I get something, and then the false ego takes it over and says, let's show this to the world, that you're actually the most humble person who ever lived. Or you're the greatest saint who ever lived. Or any kind of activity. Rather, if, if one can become internalized and actually realize that I'm motivated to really come to the spiritual platform and I'm trying to impress Krishna within the heart and my spiritual master and trying to show that I can follow what Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, then I develop this all-important spiritual integrity. And that leads to something that's extremely valuable, which is inner certainty. In the lower stages of bhakti, one is sometimes certain and sometimes not. I sometimes think this is the right thing to do, and other times I think, actually, uh, wanton living in the material world is more important, and I should just be myself. I don't have to follow any scripture. This is the kanishta adhikari, weak faith. But when one begins to develop in devotional service, one comes to the point of having strong faith. And this means that one has an inner certainty that by doing devotional service, I'm doing the right thing. There is no other right thing. <laughs> that is the right thing. Bhakti. Shraddha Shabde Vishwas Kare Suridhanashoy Krishna Bhakti Koila Sarva Karma Kritahoy. He has this firm conviction that by doing bhakti, especially Shravanam Kirtanam, I'm doing the best thing I can possibly do, and everything else will be taken care of if I follow this path. Inner certainty. And then there's a kind of knowing beyond thinking that you develop an intuition because of your connection with Bhagavad Gita, with the Acharyas, with your spiritual master. You, you begin to, to know intuitively what's the right thing to do. And you're living a life, and you know it, that's backed by the will of God. If you take off on your own, you're always uncertain. And this is what means brahmanda brahma tekon. You're wandering aimlessly. You're on your own in the forest of material existence. But if you align yourself with Bhagavad Gita and you say, this is me. I'm the follower of this book. Even though I can't do it properly, I believe in it and I'm going to follow it to the best of my ability. Now you're backed by God. And if you live a life that's backed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you cannot fail. Whereas if you deviate from that, then you'll fail no matter how successful you become in the material world. And it's even more dramatic the way you fail when you become successful in the material world and then it all comes crashing down at the end. Is that too heavy? <laughs> so one can come to this position which is very safe and which includes all contentment in life called nishta. It means you have a place to stand and that place of standing is your firm conviction in a conscious control of lifestyle and in hearing and chanting about the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the panacea for all of life's difficulties. Even though the fire is out, the, the fire of rajas. You have no desire to step into that fire where there's unlimited longings. Uh, you, you're running after unnecessary necessities. The fire is out. There may, may still be some smoke lingering in the air, but you're not disturbed by it. Fire is gone. That's altogether possible through the practice of bhakti yoga as given in the confines of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Everything complete one can attain. Om Tat Sat. So those are a few thoughts about attaining conscious control of lifestyle. And 
Now we'll just take a few more reflections. Yes. Sometimes also uh, we take the, as you mentioned about Shudra Vishwaskari means Sarva Karma Krita in the sense that strong faith. But there was an example of uh, a disciple of uh, Advaita Acharya like Kamal, Kamal Kanta Vishwas, how he presented uh, in a way it is superior and contradictory at the same time. So he asked Pratabhudra to uh, the loan of 300 rupees to be, you know, cleaned off. And at the same time, before he started, he said that Advaita Acharya is an incarnation of Supreme Personality to Godhead. He is Narayan, but he has 300 rupees of debt. So, in the sense, you know, that kind of bhakti, which is there, means Sudra Viswas is there in Advaita Acharya, but at the same time, we find out the deficiency in God. Sometimes we do not achieve what we desire for, as you mentioned about Dhruva Maharajana. We have a mistrust in the process of devotional service. And that is reflected as an example of Kamal Kanta Vishwa. So we are, all of us, or maybe not all, but some of us have this similar tendency. We have a faith in God, but sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it doesn't happen. We act like Kamal Kanta Vishwa, then God is okay, but he cannot pay the debt of 300 rupees. So, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu clarified a nice way, so I just wanted to bring this insight that how gradually reading such example we can transcend to complete faith in God. Thank you very much. That was very nice. Uh, I was reading a lecture, uh, listening to a lecture and it said, by Sachinandan Maharaj, it said, we are, at a, we are in a very dis dangerous situation and at a very dangerous place, so we have enough motivation to chant. Yes, very parallel with what we were talking about, good. Two more? Yes. I appreciated your comments where you said that we cannot help anybody's material body because their karma is already laid out because so many times we think we are doing this and that. Yep. I put up a bee bird feeder in my backyard, f filled it up with bird seed. And then uh, I was thinking, um, I'm such a great lover of the birds. <laughs> taking care of those poor little finches. <laughs> and they came and ate everything, and then they flew off and ate stuff everywhere else. And they didn't care if I filled it up again. It was just yet another source. And I looked out into the vast world, and I thought, oh, Krishna's already taking care. And there's a, there's a complex one might develop that I'm the friend. But Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, I'm the friend. So having an awareness that Krishna is the friend and introducing people to Krishna as the friend rather than I'm the friend, I'm giving you charity, I'm going to help you cure cancer, which is an impossibility. Ultimately, it'll come back or something else will get you, uh, is a kind of fallacy. Yes. Uh, yes. I like the point about the the point which you mentioned about spiritual integrity that the yes. more one is able to fight the lower self and make have that small victories the more one feels that there is an inner certainty that like, what I'm doing is the right thing actually and that helps to keep going in the right direction. Yeah, that will shine forth also. That's what attracts people uh, to a devotee is when a devotee actually has spiritual integrity because he or she has actually followed the process and they, they have that inner certainty. That is, the person who's practicing has the inner certainty. It begins to shine forth from their countenance that I'm doing this. Uh, and that's the most celebrated of all qualities in the world. That somebody's actually following the process or sincerely trying at every turn, is not cheating in any way. Then that person actually becomes extremely valuable in the world just as an example for others 
who then think maybe it's possible for me to do that. That's why devotees are celebrated at all levels, whatever level they can achieve, honestly. They become greatly appreciated in the world, or not, <laughs> because <laughs> people become envious also, that how dare you try to break out of the, this thing that nobody else can break out from. How, 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 how have you attained the audacity to, to try to become uh, advanced? You know, um, Mukarvin, you had a point. Make a last point. You were just um, so I mean, bathing in the verses of Bhagavad Gita from chapter one to eighteen. It was amazing to in your class, and uh, practically I like the point that you told about merge in the process. And I, <laughs> I just watching yesterday one of your one of the clip that some devotee has like they are welcoming you in the Pune and then they are generally whenever they welcome they sing and you are dancing in <laughs> ecstasy. I thought wow, this is the first time I am seeing them <laughs> welcoming and then you are also dancing with them. So it it make me what you are saying just now that you really talk what you are. <laughs> well, saying. everybody knows Pune. <laughs> if you go to Pune, you can't help but merge. That is the that is the best. Uh, spiritual ashram on earth because Radhi Sham's there and nobody's better than Radhi Sham. <laughs> Nobody. He just, he's there and everybody's feeding off his spiritual energy. There's so many Mahatmas there because Radhi Sham is there. Such a pure soul. So when I go there, all the way there my, in my heart I'm dancing because I'm going to see Radhi Sham or see all the people that he's inspired even if he's not there. So that's why I dance. And I remember um, when Virjendra Nanda came uh, to ISV, mm -hmm. who did you come with? Virjendra Kumar. Virgendra Kumar, who did you come with? When you first came? You came from Pune, right? Yeah. Who, who came with you? Abhijit. Abhijit. So they both came. And they came to our old temple from a tunnel <laughs> that comes from Pune and it comes up into the ground in our old temple. That's why we got so many devotees over there. They'd come from Pune under the ground, and then they, all of a sudden in the Arctic, in the middle of Arctic, they just pop up. <laughs> and one day he and Abhijit popped up, and they started dancing, because they were, practically they were shot from a cannon that came from Pune. <laughs> and they were jumping, and they were touching the ceiling, and I thought, where are these people from? They said, Pune. I said, yes, Pune. Hare Krishna. And thank you everyone to jo who joined us online tonight. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki. Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman. Hey, Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman. Nachari Armarman.